No one likes a pest invasion, especially when you're running a multi-million dollar food and beverage operation. Not only can birds, rodents, and insects be a nuisance, but are also a food safety issue and a liability. How can you prevent pests from getting into your facility? With me on the podcast today are Jerry Heath and Sharon Dobesh of the Industrial Fumigate Company, or IFC. In this episode of the Food for Thought podcast, we're talking all about the strategies to keep outside pests from getting in your facility, as well as what you can do if they get in. Enjoy this special bonus episode. Welcome to this special bonus episode of the Food for Thought podcast. Jerry, Sharon, I am so delighted to have you on the podcast today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's a pleasure, Erin. Good to be here. Yes. So we're recording this in the springtime, and uh, something I noticed, even around my own home, is the uptick of the number of flies or bugs I see flying around. I would imagine food processors have a very similar issue. What type of pests would processors typically expect to see in the spring? Okay, um, in the springtime, we're going to see all kinds of pests. It's going to include birds, rodents, and insects. Um, Rodents are typically going to be mice and rats. There could be some other wildlife as well, Um, several different species of birds. And when it comes to insects, you're going to, especially early in the year, see a lot of flies. Uh, Things like ground beetles are going to start getting active, roly-polies, other uh, insects such as the nighttime flying moths. And, you know, as the spring progresses into early summer, then eventually you kind of just start seeing a little of everything. Some of those uh, invaders that we typically see in the spring are truly seasonal spring invaders, and uh, others are are really year-round pests that uh, you know just become active again or more active in the spring, such as the rodents. But they're truly year-round. What would you say are the most common outside areas that facilities see pest activity? Uh, uh, one one in particular comes to mind would be somewhere around the front entrance to a facility where there's frequently some uh, shrubbery or a little bit of landscaping and oftentimes a bark mulch. And that bark mulch is just tremendous pest habitat for some of those things that Sharon just mentioned, the millipedes and sow bugs and, and ground beetles and so forth, just... Uh, love that ground that uh, ground mulch uh, that bark mulch material and for that matter uh, rodents as well Um, they always seem to come around and spread fresh mulch in this part of the country in central united states along about february and that is just the one most wonderful bedding for for rodents Uh, so that's one hot spot and uh, there are remedies for that we always like to recommend for example that uh, bark mulch be replaced with gravel mulch systems that won't be such uh, good habitat for many, many different kinds of pests. Another kind of real uh, hot spot for activity of invaders is going to be around any kind of waste uh, collection uh, area, uh, dumpsters, compactors, things of that nature. Again, that's a year-round attraction. Uh, and uh, then there are other areas where, you know, dock doors where there might be outdoor lights and uh, trucks coming and going and, and doors open and allowing for entry uh, along uh, dock doors and so forth. So uh, lots of opportunities for pests to find places of entry. Yeah, and keep in mind also that things like boneyards and construction areas are another really heavy area. As spring comes in, a lot of facilities, you know, start looking at upgrades and other work that they need to do. So that can be another area that there can be harborages and insects that either come in with materials that come onto site 
or that they've taken up residency in. And one more is even the roof. Uh, the roof tends to collect an awful lot of debris. Uh, in many food processing plants, you know, there are oh, flour and similar kinds of materials that get blown out onto the roof from time to time, and that material uh, becomes very highly attractive to lots and lots of pests. And so uh, there is a point of entry as well. One of the things we mentioned before was about flies. And I know we've heard those can be a real concern for many facilities. How does IFC handle that type of call? Uh, we always try to uh, find the root cause, the, the whatever it is that's the main attraction to the flies. And many, many things can attract flies at a food plant. Uh, sometimes it's just, you know, the, the side of a building that, the sunshine hits and makes a nice warm place for them to roost and so forth, and they you know, go around the corner and they're in a door. Uh, other times it's uh, neighboring uh, farms or whatever it might be that, that create odors that are attractive or, or uh, habitat with uh, things that are being spread on food, on fields, I'm sorry. Uh, so we try to find that that point of attraction, or it might be waste, waste you know, the food plant waste materials and how that's being handled. Uh, so, you know, we try to find those sources. Uh, and then number one with flies, at least the larger flies, would be the simple advice to keep the doors closed. Uh, most of the large flies come in as invaders, as opposed to small flies, such as drain flies, fruit flies, and some other kinds of small flies that are actually living and breeding within the food plant, and that's a whole different uh, category. But uh, when most people talk about flies, I think they're talking mostly about the large flies, and, and they are more inclined to actually be later in the summer uh, to reach their peak populations and, and peak uh, problem times. Can one of you help me understand something? Why is it that we start seeing stored product pests in the spring, but don't have any in the winter? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, a lot of times we just think of stored product pests as being indoors or in ingredients and things, but they are actually um, a communal type uh, insect. They occur naturally in nature. So again, just like flies, we take a look around at that environment that the facility is located in, if there are, by chance, grain fields that have been harvested, they can be hiding in that debris in the fields and surviving on the grain that's fallen to the ground. Uh, again, things like feedlots where they're feeding grain would be a source, grain elevators nearby where grain is stored, um, and then there's also any other uh, you know, spilled grain outside their own facility that hasn't been cleaned up and other stored products Again, that gets back to cleaning up waste and other attractants, but they really do naturally occur in the environment. Some of them can fly two to three miles easily um, to get to a new site. So when the, in the spring when it starts warming up and they can get active, they do naturally start to disperse and fly around just because they are naturally in the environment. We think of those insects as being grain feeders primarily, but uh, they're much more general in their feeding uh, behaviors than that actually. Uh, even the pollen in many flowers would be, you know, very nutritious and very attractive to them. And, and uh, many kinds of seeds, uh, you know, weeds and things outdoors, you know, uh, produce seeds that aren't much different than grain. Uh, so they find lots and lots of things to uh, feed on in nature. Uh, the population levels can actually be higher outdoors than indoors, uh, surprisingly. And it's sometimes a good idea to maintain a couple of the uh, stored product pest pheromone traps for the flying types uh, at a couple outdoor locations around the uh, food processing plants just to have a little bit of a uh, monitor on the outdoor populations and you know, compare that to what's going on indoors. But uh, again, you might be surprised that there would be a lot more uh, captures outdoors than, than would be captured indoors in 
monitoring traps. Food facilities have a lot of cleaning protocols in place. And because of that, you'd think there would be fewer pests. Yet that doesn't seem to be the case. Why are pests? attracted to food plants? Well, there are lots of reasons. I think I touched on a couple earlier. It might be just a sunny a sunny outdoor wall that is warm and attractive for things like flies to roost on. Uh, might be cooler temperatures on the interior that are attractive on, you know, particularly hot, dry days. Um, and uh, probably the biggest factor would be odors, odors that come from the the processing that will be attractive to flies around the outdoor neighborhood of the food plant and uh, uh, odors that are present, you know, in the immediate exterior area from spillage and the, the waste containers and such that are, uh, that have collected, you know, wastes and have gotten wet and started to ferment and mold and, and so forth. It just makes a very, very attractive uh, situation for for lots of lots of pests that could be rodents, roaches, flies, and others, um, and for that matter, even uh, some of that organic debris and so forth could be uh, a medium for development of pathogens. So you got a whole complex of vectors uh, in these pests, and and also mediums for uh, for pathogens. So it really is a uh, is an area that throughout the whole food processing industry is is needing more attention uh, to keep those waste collection and disposal uh, facilities in a little better sanitary condition. Let's shift for a bit and talk about birds. How can they impact a facility? And a follow up to that: How can you remedy birds from getting in or causing issues? Okay, um, birds are going to be attracted to all kinds of things. Again, things like the odors are going to draw them in, but in particular, they really like to have a food source. And birds may actually kind of scope out the facility and get used to the patterns and know when the food is going to be out and know when to swoop in. But most important in the spring is to keep them from setting up a roosting site because once they get their nests established and they start getting into that pattern of egg laying and things, it's very, very difficult to remove birds after that point. So it's easier to discourage them um, and keep them away if you keep things cleaned up and if you can scare them off and get them out of the area of the facility prior to them getting their roosting and their nesting sites well established for the year. Um, you know, and how can you remedy birds? Uh, there's a lot of different types of products out there. Unfortunately, with birds, there's never really a silver bullet or a one-size-fits-all. So there are scare tactics, either visual or noise-type scare tactics. There's bird netting to keep them out of some areas if, you know, you're trying to keep them off of certain ledges or around you know, rooftop equipment, things like that. You can put up netting that they can't get through. Um, and then, you know, there's also ways to take care of them if they get inside a facility using things like mist nets. Uh, so there's a variety of different products out there, um, spikes. Um, some things have some, like, a little bit of electrocution. Um, again, sounds, lights. There's a lot of different things that can be used in the key is usually rotation and not just putting something out there and expecting it to take care of your bird problem, but to rotate different tactics um, and to continually stay on top of it. It's a tough one. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I once kind of analyzed all the different bird products on the market, and I came up with about 100 different more or less unique uh, products or uh, techniques uh, and uh, yeah, they, most of those on the market, uh, the greatest greatest number by far, are suited for low pressure situations, and that would be, you know, birds that are just kind of coming in and landing on a roof and and spending a little bit of time and flying away. Uh, but when you get birds that start to spend the night or nest. That is absolutely the highest level of bird pressure. And as Sharon was saying, uh, if they establish nests, it's very, very difficult to uh, 
to uh, get them away from those nests. You can harass them terribly, but they're still going to go back to that nest. Uh, and uh, oh, uh, it's that nesting behavior that really gets bird problems escalated to the huge problem that they are at some places. Uh, the most buildings, if you look around an urban lands landscape, for example, don't have a bird issue, but you know, if birds have been allowed to come in, you don't even hardly notice the numbers, but they establish nests, and then they're back again the next year for more nests, and pretty soon you have a rookery for that that bird flock, and, and it's really hard to dislodge those things. So timely uh, control efforts and, and excluding the birds from those nest sites and so forth is uh, is most important. Uh, let me also remark about the indoor birds that virtually every building is susceptible to at some time or another. Uh, birds get in any number of ways. I, I can think of one food plant where there were little holes and things amongst some of the bumper pads at their dock doors, and birds would find their way in through those looking, I suppose, probably for a, a, some kind of a dark cavity to nest in. But lo and behold, they found themselves inside the food plant. And when a bird gets into a food plant, whether it's through an open door or some other way, they're going to be surprised to find themselves in, a, in an altogether new environment and probably a little bit confused. And pretty soon they'll take up a race, a racetrack kind of a flight pattern around the facility. And that's where mist nets can be especially useful for trapping those birds that have come in. A mist net is a very, very fine uh, netting material, uh, and you put it up on poles and so forth. Think a little bit like a uh, volleyball net, except the net is a little larger. Uh, and the, the netting is so fine that the birds can't see it, they'll fly into it and become entrapped. So bird gets in, first uh, thing to do is, of course, take measures to uh, to um, attend to food safety matters, you know, block off certain areas or cover certain things that are uh, highly sensitive. Uh, then try to encourage the bird to uh, fly out, uh, maybe turn out some lights, show them an open door, maybe uh, herd them a little bit with laser lights or something of that nature, and, uh, and see if you can't get it to fly out. If they won't fly out, then that's the time to bring in the uh, or put up the mist net. That's something I would recommend every food facility have on hand that the people in the plant can uh, learn how to use and, and deploy when necessary. It's not something you leave up all the time. You try to capture a bird and disentangle it and get it out. Uh, another thing I have to mention here, too, is the aspect of shooting. Uh, it's a necessity sometimes. You can hardly close down a, a multi-million dollar operation for the sake of a sparrow that's flying around inside, but you can't tolerate that bird either. So uh, sometimes uh, shooting is a necessity. It's, uh, ex it's expedient, you know, to uh, take care of a bird that way, but it's very controversial. Any kind of a firearm or something that looks like a firearm is going to be alarming to employees. Uh, they're all manner of safety issues. You always have to wonder where is that pellet or BB going to go or what could it get into. Uh, all manner of collateral damage is a potential, so it's, it's a very touchy subject. Many companies have come around to developing uh, company policies and protocols where there are designated qualified shooters who are known to be good marksmen, uh, they have to wear a special vest, for example, or be accompanied by management and things like that, you know, uh, protocols of that nature to uh, very quickly get uh, an invading bird uh, dispatched and, and out. Oh, and finally, uh, very uh, important, whenever a bird does get in, uh, that's the time uh, to kind of analyze what happened and why and do what you can to... Uh, prevent that from repeating itself. So we covered a lot about birds. I'm very curious. What solutions has IFC found helps keep other pests out? <laughs> so most of the time to keep other pests out, we're going to be looking at exclusion techniques primarily. 
Um, it's going to be maintenance of the facility, uh, looking at not only physical maintenance of the facility, but main, maintenance type uh, ongoing things like door seals, uh, screening on windows, uh, making sure that everything's in good shape, good repair, making sure screens don't have holes in them, um, you know, going around, doing seasonal checks. And another thing that you can do to help keep pests out is to pay attention to your past trending data. Uh, every facility has or should have pest records going back two or three years. In those cases, you can go back and say, okay, this time of the year, what have we typically encountered? And so then you can be prepared for those things that may be getting active and coming in on a fairly regular basis. And you can sometimes do exterior sprays and, um, you know, just keep, get prepared to, you know, most of the time with insects especially are going to be coming into a facility. They land on the side of the building or they land on a screen. And in that case, you know, they um, also encounter a pesticide first, so hopefully maybe they don't go in, or if they go in, they'll, they'll um, probably die shortly thereafter so that, you know, it becomes more of a sanitation issue of cleaning up dead bodies, than it, uh, insect bodies, I should say, versus, um, you know, having them get into more things further into the plant. Um, and when we were talking about exclusion, and especially for screens and things like louvers, doors and windows, and, you know, a lot of questions come in about mesh size. What is the most optimum size to help keep insects out? And generally, if you're using at least a 20 mesh um, or higher, that's going to help keep out nearly all insects. Usually a 20 to 30 mesh is optimum. If you get into those really high mesh numbers, say 50, 60, 70, 80, uh, the, the weave is so tight that you may actually impede airflow, which could hurt equipment function and things like this. So sometimes you need to also consult with your uh, internal facility engineering to make sure that you're not going to be impeding airflow and causing more problems uh, with, you know, equipment. So, but, you know, most of the time it's uh, 20 mesh is going to keep almost everything out and, you know, when we talked about treating the outside of a facility, you can even sometimes treat that screening. Um, and then you can get the screens to fit large doors, windows. Um, there's a lot of different options out there to help keep insects out. And then to keep in mind for rodents, anything that's going to keep them out is going to be uh, a quarter of an inch or smaller because a mouse needs a quarter of an inch to enter. So if you have an entry or a hole, or you know, a piece of a missing door seal that's a quarter of an inch or bigger, you're going to have rodent problems. So those need to be fixed and sealed up. I'm reminded also of some questions we're getting a lot these days from facilities who are upgrading their general lighting. And they're asking us about the attractiveness of LED light fixtures. And the question really goes down to what wavelength of light a certain kind of fixture will emit. And uh, lights can be engineered to uh, attract insects like we do with insect light traps or to exclude insects if they, or to uh, prevent invasion if they uh, can uh, be engineered not to have certain wavelengths of light. So in general, those LED fixtures that a lot of facilities are going towards these days for a lot of economical reasons and so so forth. Uh, in general, they're pretty good and, and don't have those attractive wavelengths of light. But uh, that's not to say insects still won't get in for one reason or another and uh, be, for the most part, captured pretty efficiently in the insect light traps. What are some things that facility managers can be doing to prevent these outside pests from getting in? Well, one thing would be... Uh, as Sharon was mentioning, uh, you know, pay attention to those monitoring records from previous years and try to get ahead of the game and be thinking now, in fact, for pests that are going to be occurring in the summer or in the fall in invading and, and take the precautions that are appropriate, you know, early or in a timely way. Uh, so uh, there are lots of fall invaders and, you know, treatments that could be done in 
fall, sometimes as early as August or September, you know, for things that would ordinarily invade in late September or October. Um, uh, that's one thought. Uh, there's also the lighting uh, idea again, and the fact that exterior lighting could be highly attractive to lots of uh, insects, and uh, you like to have lights that are not on the building, but kind of away from the building and shining towards the building so that, you know, the cloud of insects are out in the parking lot, so to speak, not, you know, right above the door. And uh, the best kind of uh, light for outdoor lighting of that nature is uh, sodium vapor lights. Uh, mercury vapor lights, on the other hand, are going to be more attractive to insects. Oh, and there are probably some other techniques as well, but, yeah. but those are a couple of highlights. Right. And the other one that comes to mind for me is landscaping, um, going ahead and making sure that anything like trees, shrubs, grass up against the side of your facility is trimmed back at least 18 to 24 inches minimum. Um, again, Jerry talked at the very beginning about mulch and stuff. Maybe you want to consider replacing some of that mulch with tea gravel. Um, it's still attractive, it's still a nice landscaping option, but it's less apt to harbor all those pests that like to use the landscaping mulch for uh, either like rodent bedding or using it to feed on or things like that. So, you know, there's other options that can be done to look at landscaping to help make the facility a little less attractive or to help with inspections by keeping uh, areas up against the facility clean and free of debris so that you can see everything going on uh, on the surface of that facility. As we wrap up this episode, I'm curious, if someone wanted to learn more about what IFC offers its food processing customers, how could they go about getting in touch? Okay, there's a couple of ways. Um, they can call our 1-800 number, which is one 800 477 Four four three two, and we can put you in touch with the appropriate person to help uh, with your particular situation or contact a local area person that's in your area to take a look and see what needs to be done. Um, we also have a website, and it's um, shortened for Industrial Fumigant Company. So the web address is www.indfumco. Dot com. I might also just add in quick summary that we do offer comprehensive pest management products and services with a focus for the food industry. And that goes from routine service to fumigations, large and small, uh, fogging services, you know, special services such as uh, installation and, and analysis of uh, bird problems and installation of, of bird uh, exclusion equipment and such, um, boy, a uh, wide range of other uh, newer kinds of services such as uh, old decontamination services with uh, uh, chlorine dioxide products. They look a lot like a fumigation or operationally are a lot like a fumigation and those can be done in small spaces or very large spaces. Uh, uh, certain kinds of uh, application of cleaning products that are especially applicable to those uh, those waste receptacles and dumpsters and such like that outdoors. Uh, uh, products for sale or uh, use for your in-house people, uh, whether it be, you know, uh, occasional things that are needed for uh, use by your in-house folks like a, like bird uh, mist net or or maybe wasp and hornet aerosols for maintenance people to use when they encounter nests on the roof or things of that nature. We really have a comprehensive uh, portfolio of products and services. Well, Jerry, Sharon, thank you so much for being on the special bonus episode of the Food for Thought podcast with me today. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you on.
for everyone listening to the Food for Thought podcast today, thank you for tuning in. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and just about everywhere you can listen to a podcast. Be sure to tune in next time as we talk more about the stories behind the headlines of the food and beverage industry. Take care. Have a great day.